Good evening. I'm Ed Feinstein. I'm one of the rabbis here at Valley Beth Shalom, and it's a very special privilege to welcome Friends of Americans for Peace Now and Friends of Dr. Jerry Bubis for this very special occasion, the Jerry Bubis Lecture. Thank you. <laughs> Valley Beth Shalom is a community of spiritual, intellectual, and cultural Jewish growth. And we believe that the State of Israel and our support for the State of Israel is best served by a vigorous and open debate about its future, its values, its character, its security. And so we are particularly privileged to welcome friends from American from Peace Now and debate these points of view openly, with respect, with civility, with deep love for the State of Israel and deep reverence for its dreams. It is a special privilege to welcome all of you here supporters of APN, as well as friends from the community for this conversation. And it is a very special privilege to honor my teacher and my dear friend Jerry and Ruby Bubis, who are here tonight to be celebrated by all of us. When I was a young rabbinical student, I happened into their living room for a class in Jewish education. And I have been Jerry's student ever since, because these are human beings who understand that the Jewish people grows from the heart as well as from the mind, and that Jewish life has to be lived with open hearts and with open minds. And it has been a wonderful privilege to share these years together. Jerry is one of my heroes, and to be in his presence is a gift for all of us. So let us please welcome Steve Kaplan, who's chairman for this evening, and a few words from our guest, Dr. Jerry Bubis. Thank you, Rabbi, and uh, thank all of you for coming to the fourth annual lecture of the Jerry Bubis Lecture Series. Uh, we uh, seem to get a bigger crowd every year, and I'm hoping that that will continue on into the future, at least until the moment when there is peace in Israel and people will lose interest in this subject. Uh, I first met uh, Jerry Bubis when I was the chair of the Southern, Southwestern region of the American Jewish Congress. Uh, Jerry was always a voice of reason, sober intelligence, but also with passion and compassion and always ready with a great Yiddish phrase. And uh, Jerry, it's an honor to be up here and it's an honor to be able to welcome you also to this lecture that was established in your honor uh, when you retired from the board of the Americans for Peace Now organization. Uh, I want to uh, say a few things before we get started. Um, First of all, I just want to thank a few people. I want to thank Sandy Weiner, who is my co-chair for Americans for Peace Now here in Los Angeles. And I want to thank David Pine, wherever he is, our director of uh, Americans for Peace Now, for putting this event together. He's done a fantastic job these last four years. Um, and I also want to urge everybody to look at all of the uh, brochures that are on the table outside. In particular, uh, Americans for uh, Peace Now has an annual trip to Israel, which uh, I would urge all of you to consider. And also in March of next, I shouldn't say a, uh, in next year, and in March of next year uh, in Washington, D.C., J Street, our sister organization, is having its annual conference. Uh, the J Street conference is always a remarkably uh, exciting, uh, wide-ranging uh, symposium of opinions, uh, terrific speakers, and I urge everybody also to think about attending that if they are able to do that. Um, uh, Jerry, uh, you probably never saw the movie uh, Wayne's World, uh, <laughs> but in that movie, uh, Wayne and Garth made a little phrase very popular, and it's, we are not worthy. And Jerry, I sort of feel that way uh, having you here uh, uh, watching what we're doing and keeping your dream alive of ha continuing the dialogue on peace in the Middle East. I'm going to bring a mic up to you if you, can, if you don't mind and I'd like you to say a few words. Is this working? working. There we go. Thank you, Steve. There are so many people I would like to thank I'll name none except the 
person that I've been thinking about all day, Arthur Stern, Oliva Shalom, where Danny used to stay and really, really get involved with Arthur Stern and, uh, and what he stood for. I will take no more words just to thank everybody who's here and tell everybody how pleased I am that we have opportunities to listen to each other and argue with each other civilly and responsibly. I, I do want to thank our rabbi and I want to thank David Pine and I'll stop thanking anybody else. Thank you very much. We've always tried to have timely and important speakers at this event. Uh, last year we had Mark Rosenblum, who is the founder of Americans Peace Now, for Peace Now. Uh, before that, we had the ambassador from the state of Jordan. We had Hagit Ofran, who's one of the leading peace activists in the state of Israel. Uh, this year, we have Danny Seidemann. Uh, if they gave an award uh, for the misnomer of the year, uh, I would think this year it would be Yerushalayim, because uh, at least it, isn't, it is no longer the city of peace. Um, if there's anybody in the world who knows more about Jerusalem, it's Danny Seidemann. Uh, I've taken trips to Israel where Danny has led us through tours of East Jerusalem, neighborhoods that are being uh, occupied by uh, religious settlers, creating great divisiveness within, neighbor, within neighbor, Arab neighborhoods, uh, outside colonies outside of Israel, uh, outside of Jerusalem, and Danny, he, it's as if he knows every stone and every rock in that city. Um, he's the founder of an organization called Terrestrial Jerusalem. He is a lawyer, he's an American born but Israeli lawyer who has done a lot of legal work also on issues of civil rights and property rights in the state of Israel. Um, we're living now in a time of the desecularization of Jerusalem. We're living in a time of the resacralization, if that is the right word, of Jerusalem. And I don't think that there is a person on this planet who is more capable of address addressing the complex issues that those developments are giving rise to than Danny Seidemann. So without any further ado, let me introduce, oh, one last thing, Danny. Uh, this lecture series must be getting important because Danny has taken off his trademark crew neck sweater and actually put on a shirt and tie. We're getting somewhere, come on up. Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, I'm a guest in California. I, I, I'm not at home here. I think I came to LA. I came to LA for the first time when I was 35, and I've been here probably three or four times since, no more than two, three uh, days at a time, and it's always for the same reason. It's from the folks here from APN and Jerry among them, and uh, Arthur, who is sorely missed, uh, a community that's able to generate this kind of devotion, Ahavat Yisrael, love of Israel, an intelligent devotion, um, you can be very proud that these are members of your community. So when this opportunity came to be with my friends, I didn't think for one minute. I'm, you guys are the best. Um, I do probably a lot of public speaking. Most of my work is quiet meetings with senior officials, foreign ministers. Um, I'm coming from Washington now where I had meetings in the White House, uh, meetings in uh, the State Department. Um, I don't suffer from stage fright. And for some reason, I'm scared of you guys. <laughs> uh, I am suffering from stage fright because uh, there's a daunting challenge this evening. And that is to share with you what my Jerusalem is and I know that there are going to be things that you'll be hearing that are not entirely easy to every ear. Um, but I'm going to do it honestly because I think that we owe that to each other. 
and I look forward for more of a discussion than my lecturing at you. I want to begin with one of the most repressed periods in Israeli history. So it's the period that I think Israel has tried to wipe out of our memory. It's called Kufata Hamtana, the waiting period. It was the three weeks between the date and end of May of um, 1967 when Nasser closed down Israel, the access to the Straits of, through the Straits of Tehran and the outbreak of the war. And uh, just below my office in West Jerusalem is a place called Gan Atzma'ut, Independence Park. And uh, at night, the chief rabbis came to Independence Park and consecrated it as a cemetery because the anticipation was that Israel would be in need in a massive number of graves in anticipation of that war. The IDF built uh, 10,000 wooden coffins in anticipation of the number of casualties. And there were threats of the annihilation of Israel, threats that were give, made seriously and were taken seriously in all of this less than a generation after the end of the Holocaust. Uh, we all know that history worked itself out differently and that within a matter of days we had the lightning victory of taking the Sinai, taking the Golan Heights, and of course taking the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, but nowhere was there more of a biblical encounter than the revisiting of Jerusalem and the holy sites, the Kotel, the old city, Harabai, uh, Harabai, the Temple Mount, Mount of Olives, and you cannot understand what Jerusalem is for Israelis and Jews throughout the world not only outside of the context of the Six-Day War, but what preceded it. The Talmudic uh, uh, term is It's from the high peak to the, the, the depths. Well, we went from a fear of annihilation to biblical salvation, and even devout secularists like myself can only understand this by invoking biblical language. In the wake of that war, something was born that is easily mocked today. It's the mantra. Mantra is something that you all know, you may not know, you know it. Uh, the mantra is Jerusalem, the undivided capital of Israel that will never be redivided, which is one word and a noun, and you have to be able to recite it seven times in a row in order to get elected to Congress. Jerusalem, the undivided capital of Israel that will never be redivided, and that was, for many years and is no longer an article of faith. We all know that Jerusalem belongs to the Jewish people, uh, that it's undivided, it will never be returned, it's eternal, we've returned them never to leave it, etc. And it is almost treasonous to entertain the idea of dividing Jerusalem. Well, I'm going to be a bit honest with you. No, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. There's a school of thought of folks who kind of mock those people who say Jerusalem the undivided capital. It's sort of the equivalent um, of uh, mocking the clueless American tourist in a Hawaiian shirt and sunglasses and binoculars. Um, there's nothing more despicable than that. Uh, I think that many of uh, the Jews in the American Jewish community believe in a united Jerusalem, have been educated to believe in a united Jerusalem, and they're not dumb, and their intentions are not bad. The devotion and love of Jerusalem comes from the same wellsprings as the devotion and love to Israel, and nobody is entitled to diss anybody or to critique anybody because of that. Uh, and that's why I am a bit scared because I'm telling you tonight that Jerusalem isn't a divided city and it won't, it, it isn't a united city, it won't be a united city. But what I'm asking you, and I hope you will at least accept this tentatively, is not to abandon your love of Jerusalem, but to put that love to the test of reality and to transform what is what I take to be a teenage infatuation and to turn it into a mature 
and adult love. The Jerusalem that I come from is a scarred and bleeding city. Uh, but even before it began to bleed on July 2nd of this year, uh, the mantra only existed in the imaginations of ideologues who were unwilling to put it to the test. Is Jerusalem a Jewish city? Of course it is. There are 508,000 Israelis, Israeli Jews, living in Jerusalem. That is two and a half times more than it ever was in its history. The last time was in the second temple period, Kufat Bayachini, where there were 200,000 Jews. It is the largest Jewish, history, Jew, Jewish city in history, but there are 38% of the population who are not Jews. They were 25% of the population in 1967, they're 38% today, and they will be a majority in our lifetime. And not only are they not Jews, they're not Israelis. We've never treated them as Israelis. They've never seen themselves as Israelis. They are not Israeli citizens. In 1948, Israel didn't ask the Palestinians who were within Israel's borders what they wanted, we imposed our citizenship, and they are citizens of Israel today. They're Israeli. Even the, you know, the, the, the most despicable of the radical Islamists, they are Israeli. Not so with the Palestinians of East Jerusalem. They don't have the right to vote, and they're 38% of the population. They don't have Israeli passports. They are entitled to vote in municipal elections, but they don't, they choose not to. In the last elections, we have a mayor who writes his letters to foreign dignitaries in the name of all of the people who elected me as their mayor. I represent everybody in Jerusalem, I'm a nutnik, I check. There were elections a year ago, October of last year, there were 157,000 Palestinian eligible voters of them, 1,101 cast a ballot. That's a 0.7% voter turnout. It's worse than Kansas, Dorothy. And they did so. They pay a price for it, and they're sending a message. We are not Israeli. Is Jerusalem the capital of Israel? Well, for me, it is. I've argued 25 cases before the Israeli Supreme Court on Jerusalem-related issues. I visit the Knesset. I have met even with our new president. Please keep an eye on President Rivlin. There are distant rumblings of greatness there. Keep an eye on him. He's somebody to watch. But I am now going to do a magic trick. You know, this is a bit of stand-up. I'm going to now show you all of the foreign embassies in Jerusalem. You want to see them again? There, there aren't any. Uh, yesterday, President Obama once again uh, invoked his presidential power not to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Now, you may say, ah, Barack Hussein Obama, what do you expect? No, the same with similar Muslims like George W. Bush and President Clinton and every American president since 1949. Jerusalem is a contested city. Is Jerusalem a united city? I think that nobody today can say that it's a united city, especially in the hemorrhaging city that we've seen in, in recent weeks. We go to different schools. We shop in different places. We walk different streets. We study different curricula in school. We speak different languages. Uh, and that was the case throughout the period since 1967. My friends from Tel Aviv don't like to come to Jerusalem. I'll tell you why. Um, there's too much God in Jerusalem and not enough sex in Tel Aviv. It's the other way around. 
Uh, but some of them will want to come to Jerusalem and do something daring, with exotic, with a whiff of danger. They will go two blocks over into East Jerusalem to the quaint American Colony Hotel, have a gin and tonic in the courtyard, and think they're doing something very special. I call it a Jewish safari. That's as far as they go, and today they won't go that far. So empirically, when you look at the reality, Jerusalem is a Jewish city, but it's a binational city. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, but it's probably the most contested city in the world. And Jerusalem is not a united city. Now, I'm going to tell you a bit, what, what I'm telling you is fact, and you can see it. Before we talk a bit about what has happened to Jerusalem during the course of this summer, since I'm a lawyer, I'm going to give you some due diligence beyond the fact what is my agenda, what is my belief. If you come to me and say, I do not believe an agreement between Israelis and Palestinians is possible. It's unachievable. The gaps are too wide. For whatever reason, I will vehemently disagree with you. I believe an agreement is possible. But I concede you can make a very, very compelling argument. But if on the other hand you come to me and say, oh, I believe an agreement's possible, and we can arrive at a permanent agreement with the Palestinians, and we will make, keep on to all of Jerusalem, I will quietly take you aside, spare you the embarrassment, and ask you what you've been smoking, because obviously you and I are not living in the same universe. This conflict may never end. That's possible. If this conflict ends, it ends in Jerusalem, it ends in a deal, the end of Israeli occupation of East Jerusalem in exchange for a recognition of the legitimacy of an Israeli capital in Yerushalayim, which I believe will be the crowning achievement of Zionism. I believe there will be embassies in Jerusalem one day, and that will symbolize the victory of the Jewish people over exile. And the first embassy that will come to be Jeru to Jerusalem will be the Palestinian embassy, and until there's a Palestinian embassy, there will be no others. And once the Palestinian embassy comes, there will be a Saudi embassy, a Tunisian embassy, and an Indonesian embassy. That is my belief. This was far more theoretical four months ago. It's not theoretical today. I come to you from a hemorrhaging and wounded city. Um, and I'm going to give you a few vignettes about what it looks like, where it's coming from, and then we'll open our conversation. For me, the snapshot of this latest uprising, and it is an uprising, uh, was in mid-August at the beer festival. Israel has some great boutique beers, highly recommended. And there's a beer festival at the old train station, and uh, yuppies of all ages sit around and sip beer. And we were sitting there, and if you listened closely, you could hear distant thuds and booms. And they came from a place that was no more than 300 or 400 yards away. It was coming from Silwan. Palestinian neighborhood, which has been the target of settler takeovers. And the thuds that we were hearing were Molotov cocktails, stun grenades, um, tear gas canisters, and when the wind was right, you could smell the, the tear gas. The folks in Silwan had no idea that we were sitting 300 yards away drinking beer, and we had no idea that for at that point, for six weeks, the Neighborhoods of East Jerusalem had been on fire every night. And Jerusalem's been aflame every night since July 2nd. It's an indication of the degree of separation that until the murderous terror broke out in vehicular assaults along the light rail and the absolutely horrendous massacre, and there's no other word, in Harnof, we 
Israeli Jerusalemites were oblivious to what was happening in almost 40% of the city in which we're living in. So much so that Mayor Barkat begged the press not to report the violence because it was bad for business, bad for culture, bad for tourism. It's sort of like having Rahm Emanuel in Chicago saying, don't report the murders that take place in Chicago. It's not good for the city's image. During the second intifada, which was murderous, the atmosphere in West Jerusalem was much worse. East Jerusalem wasn't a dangerous place. I could go with impunity everywhere in East Jerusalem after the intifada broke out. Where was it dangerous? Below my office in West Jerusalem, it was targeted by suicide bombers. And this is not just an impression. The Shin Bet tells us in the entire seven years of the second intifada, Israel arrested 270 individuals for security-related offenses. Seven years and 270 people, we arrested 200 every week or two in the West Bank. There were 11,000 detainees for terror or security-related offenses. Almost none of them came from East Jerusalem. Today, I can't go down the road from Talpiot to Zurbacher. I can't visit my friends in Beit Hanina. It's dangerous. I already took a rock to the head a year ago in Surbacher before this broke out. I'm not a martyr. And I'm not squeamish. I gauge the risks. We have arrested, since July 2nd, more than 1,300 individuals. That's more than four times as many in five months that we did in seven years, and more than half of them are kids, boys, under the age of 18. We have arrested more than one half of 1% of all of the male kids under the age of 18 in Jerusalem. And by the way, I'm not accusing Israel of anything. I mean, it's the job of the police to protect life, limb, and property. But the key of what I'm looking at comes from an attempt to understand one question. And that question is, what possesses 13, 14, 15-year-old kids, and they're good kids, these aren't thugs, I know them, what possesses them to go out night after night after night for five months and clash with the Israeli police? Their parents are not sending them. There are no politicians left in Jerusalem to send them. We've crushed every political expression in East Jerusalem more radical than a scout meeting, and I'm not exaggerating, we have also crushed scout meetings. There's nobody to talk to. They're not being sent. You can tell me incitement all the time, Abu Mazen couldn't incite a crack dealer. He's not charismatic enough. Uh, these kids don't read the Wall Street Journal, and they're not you know, walking around listening to Al Jazeera, and they're going out on a nightly basis. And I would like to give three short answers to why this is happening, and then we'll, we'll open this up. There are the detonators, the acute reasons, the incidents that are so horrendous that you, you, you get a violent response. And by, I am by no means justifying the violent response. And that explains why things blow up and break out. But it doesn't explain why the violence is sustained over time. And then you have the underlying reasons. And they explain not why things break out, but why they continue to burn. And you have to look at both of these. And I see four things that I can point out. Number one, the horrendous murder of a Palestinian teenager, Muhammad Abu Khder, who was abducted from the stoop in front of his father's store, uh, murdered, burned alive. His murderers were apprehended, and it came to symbolize the vulnerability of Palestinians. It's not an isolated incident, as a murder it is. But even these days, it's dangerous for Palestinians to wander the streets of, of West Jerusalem. There are vigilantes out there who hunt Palestinians, and most of my Palestinian friends will not 
speak Arabic on the streets of West Jerusalem. By the way, it's equally dangerous for an Israeli in, in East Jerusalem. And these kids identify. More than they identify, it's not an isolated event. It taps it on something very deep. Israel is intending to demolish the homes of the families of the terrorists. The terrorists are dead. Their families. And their families have not been implicated in the murderous acts of their relations. If they were implicated, they'd be indicted, they'd be in jail. But they're not guilty, except by family relations, and their homes will be demolished. And in the past, the Israeli Supreme Court has upheld the legality of that. Very problematic. Um, but today, it's even more problematic because every Palestinian is asking themselves, you're demolishing the homes of the Palestinian terrorists. What about the homes of the terrorists who murdered Muhammad Abu Khdair? When are you going to be demolishing their homes? And yesterday, in a hearing before the Supreme Court, the ruling has not been handed down. The Israeli state attorney said, well, Jews don't need to be deterred. Palestinians do. Those are dangerous arguments. And what the Palestinians are hearing is, in your eyes, your Israeli eyes, your blood is red, our blood is water. And this is an event that's not over. The second thing is, it's almost, we have to admit it, just how ugly and tribal our conflict with the Palestinians is. We had a horrendous round of violence with Gaza during the summer. And there is an element in the violence in which we are the most primitive tribes, both of us. Let's be blunt, neither we nor our Palestinian enemies have been blessed with Scandinavian temperaments, put it delicately. And part of the goal of each side is to inflict as much pain on the other side as possible. And that was, by the way, part of our combat doctrine in Gaza. We will create enough pain so that the population will rise up and get rid of Hamas. Well, Israel was much more accomplished in inflicting pain on the Palestinians than they were on us, and it is not because they didn't try. We, I believe, caused disproportionate civilian suffering, but did it unintentionally. They tried intentionally and failed. So uh, no illusions. It created an enormous frustration. It's, so you are not able as a Palestinian to inflict the pain that's being inflicted on you. It's like corking a volcano. And the lava that can't erupt in Gaza will erupt where? In the West Bank. But there you have Abu Mazen, who our army says is preventing an outbreak of violence. He's sitting on the lid, on the cork of the volcano, keeping the flames down. Ironically, the one place where there can be payback, where there's an interface between Israelis and Palestinians is Jerusalem. Now, the Palestinians are not predisposed, in, of East Jerusalem, are not predisposed to violence. They are not the vanguards of Palestinian nationalism, but they said, given what we are seeing in Gaza, we can't stand idly by, and that fueled things as well. But those are a couple of the acute reasons. The, the, real, the, the real reason that I sense, these kids are rioting, they're violent because they're wise kids and they know that, they, that their parents are incapable of delivering to them the most important thing that every parent owes a child and that's a future, and they have no future. They have been cut off from the West Bank by a wall, and I'm the last one to say the wall is bad. It's got bad manifestations, but it was a necessary evil. They're not part of Palestine physically. They're not part of Israel, they're not Israeli, and they sense correctly that they live under a governance that sees them as best or views them with total apathy, at best they see them as a suspicious suck suspect element. Today they're seen as the enemy. 
we have no future. And that is what is fueling this. And you know something? They're right. Um, what we are seeing today is Jerusalem collapsing, or the mantra of United Jerusalem collapsing under the weight of its own fictions. Jerusalem cannot be a Jewish city if we are occupying close to a majority of the population against their will without political rights. It's not democratic, and it's not Jewish, and it's not sustainable. The response of official Israel, much to my regret, has derived from the mantra. One exception, pay attention to President Rivlin. He is speaking to the residents of East Jerusalem at eye level, not an accident. This has something to do with left and right, but it is far more complicated than left and right. If, as Prime Minister Netanyahu believes that Jerusalem is and should be the undivided capital of Israel, if the mayor of Jerusalem believes that, and by the way, I don't think they're faking it, I think they're genuine, then they say, East Jerusalem is not occupied. East Jerusalem is as it should be. East Jerusalem is ours, should remain that way, and the Palestinians are living under the optimal situation, the optimal circumstances that they can. And if that's the case, you don't listen to their grievances. You say, they are either ingrates, we give you social welfare benefits and you respond by throwing rocks, so what if you don't have political rights? Or they're incited into a frenzy, nonsense. Or they're inherently criminal. If I'm correct, The Palestinians of East Jerusalem are in a popular uprising because they're saying our lives are unbearable. And the Israeli policies has been, we're going to break you, and in order to do so, we will make your lives more unbearable. I think that this round of violence is going to wind down and will probably wind down over the next few weeks. There are the final dimensions of this, which we haven't even spoken about, the Temple Mount, which is another, which is both a detonator and an underlying cause, and perhaps we can talk about that. Uh, but we are re returning to a different city when it dies down. First of all, if it dies down, as I believe it will, it will die down because it will have run its course, not because of the policies of my government, because, but in spite of them. And when it dies down, the rift in the city will be greater than ever before. There have been sinews that held us together that have been torn apart, and they will not quickly heal, if ever. Hatred in Jerusalem, which didn't exist, or didn't exist in huge numbers. Hatred has been personalized, it's been popularized, it's spread, and it is common on both sides of the divide, and it's a very wounded city. I believe that since none of the underlying causes that led to this round of violence have been addressed, even before the flames of this round of violence have been extinguished, the countdown to the next round of violence has already begun. There is one way of avoiding that. And the only way is to engage our Palestinian enemies at eye level and to move forward on the deal. And the deal is simple. Ending occupation, in exchange for a secure and universally recognized legitimate Israel. The only way that that will happen is a border 
between Israel and Palestine and a border that runs through the city of Jerusalem. That will not be the end of uh, Israeli Jewish Jerusalem. That will be the beginning. That will be the crowning achievement of Zionism. Until we address these fundamental issues, we will be condemned to more of the same and worse. If we begin and address these, there is the prospect of an agreement. Uh, and that's what hangs in the balance. Uh, and in many ways, you all know, Israel will be going to elections in three or four months' time, and this is going to be probably the core issue of the coming elections. Do we proceed in the direction of Am Levadad Yishkon, the people that dwells alone in the face of total isolation or close to total isolation? Or do we take the painful steps necessary to return the Jewish people to history and to navigate the dangerous waters of the region that we're living in? Um, hold on to your seats. It's going to be interesting. Thank you. Good evening. Once again, it's a delight to welcome all of you and to uh, offer our respects and love for Dr. Jerry Bubis. Uh, there's a couple of my uh, friends, teachers, who are in the audience, and I just want to welcome them because teachers are terribly, terribly important to our community. So I want to welcome uh, Professor David Myers from UCLA. It's an honor to have you here, David, learn with you. And, uh, and my old Jewish literature professor, Dr. Bill Cutter, Nice to see you here. And uh, my colleague and teacher from the American Jewish University, Dr. Aryeh Cohen. Thank you for coming to be with us. As well as numerous rabbis who had the night off. I don't know how you got the night off, but uh, <laughs> delighted. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. Your presentation was very, very stimulating and raises a whole bunch of questions. So we're going to be here till 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. Get comfortable. I'd like to work backwards. And I'd like to begin with your last statement, and I'd like to challenge you to expand on this for us just a little bit. You said that this unbearable situation of youth without a future, cycles of violence that are going to escalate time after time after time, are going to continue until or unless we face the Palestinian, Israelis face the Palestinians eye to eye engage in a conversation to end the occupation and create, and the phrase you used was, a secure and universally recognized border that will border through Jerusalem. And the question that is always asked about this, so I know it's not the first time you've dealt with this, is, first of all, are there enough Palestinians who want that too and are willing to give up the dream of having it all and share only a piece of it and are there enough Israelis who are willing to give up the dream of having it all and only take a piece of it so that there can be such? Is this really feasible? Is this really possible in this political environment? The answer is I don't know. And, and we will only know when we put it to a test. I believe so. Um, I believe so because I'm out in the streets of East Jerusalem for the last 23 years, but you know, a while back, um, seeing the despair on the Palestinian side, can you hear now? Seeing the despair, I have to swallow the thing before I can talk into it. Think of it as an electric lolly. See, seeing right. despair on the Palestinian side, and this is over the last two years, I went and expressed my concerns that support for the two-state solution was being lost on the Palestinian side. They're becoming one-staters, irredentists. They want everything. 
and I expressed it to a major uh, embassy in Tel Aviv the, that will go nameless, but you're familiar with it. And they said, we've been doing polling in Palestine for the last 30 years, uh, including polling in Gaza, and even if we're not in Gaza, we have ways of doing it, and ironically, support of the two-state solution is on the rise. But we will know only if it is put to the test, and that means we negotiate in good faith and bring one agreement simultaneously to both peoples in a referendum. I believe in the un fundamental decency of my Palestinian enemy people. There is a murder streak in part of the population. Now the Israeli side. And here I speak with, I think, a little bit more authority. First of all, the polls, and I, I, I discount polls, but they show a general support for the two-state solution. Uh, I would put it this way. I have spent the better part of my adult life fighting settlements. Some of my best friends are settlers, and I don't, I'm not driven by a pathological hatred of settlers or settlements. I think it's going to destroy the possibility of an agreement with the Palestinians. And I think I can make a compelling argument. Having said that, Thank you. having said that, I think there's an obstacle on the Israeli side that is greater than the settlements. And by the way, there are tons of obstacles on the Palestinian side. What are the greatest obstacles on the Israeli side? The cafes in Tel Aviv and the malls in Rishon LeZion. We Israelis are sipping cappuccino on the edge of a volcano. We're in a state of denial. We don't confront the occupation. Well, the occupation's confronting us, and if we will continue and perpetuate occupation and continue settlements, Israel will not slide slowly into pariah status. We are gonna have the ceiling collapse on us. I believe that the Israeli public as a rule, and we're very varied, um, remind me of Thomas Jefferson's quip about slavery. Slavery is like holding a wolf by the ears. You're scared to hold on, and you don't dare let go. I believe that that's the Israeli attitude towards occupation. My compatriots don't want to occupy another people. We don't want to. But we're scared to let go, and you know something, I'll be blunt with you. We have what to be scared of. We, you know, the Palestinians are our enemies. Our generals, for the most part, say the dangers and security of occupation far exceed those of the risks that we calculated risk will be taking in an agreement. But we have legitimate concerns. I believe we have a current leadership. I believe that Prime Minister Netanyahu plays on Israeli anxieties and fears the way a virtuoso plays on a Stradivarius, and his political survival is based on generating the irrational fears. And I think that that is leading Israel into a very dangerous place. Uh, Israel cannot survive as a perpetually occupying power. It can't be done. So let me ask you in terms of Jerusalem, which is your expertise. There's a wall that separates, or a fence, that separates Israel from territories. And that fence has thus far apparently succeeded in stopping terrorist attacks. But now when you split Jerusalem, do you build a fence through the middle of Jerusalem? And if you don't build a fence through the middle of Jerusalem, then what keeps bad guys from coming into West Jerusalem, even if, they, even if we postulate that 99% of the Palestinian population are well-meaning people willing to compromise and accept the future in a Palestinian state, 1%, 1 percent, 1 percent of extremism poses an existential threat to Israel, especially if the Iranians get hold of a nuclear weapon and are able to smuggle it into that territory. What do you do to separate populations, or at least to assure the security of an Israeli population? What would you say to reassure your Israeli neighbors? 100%, 100%. Okay, first of all, I, I want to take a bit of exception on the separation barrier. 
Separation Barrier did make something of a contribution. Our security experts say it was a minor contribution. You know why there's no terror coming out of the West Bank? Because Abu Mazen rebuilt the Palestinian security forces under the tutelage of General Dayton and General Allen, and they never make it to the fence because they are doing everything in their power to stop it, and that's what peace is about. There isn't a wall high enough that's going to prevent terror if there is a highly motivated terrorist. But let's put that aside, okay? This is where my friends in Europe hate me most, because they talk about a shared Jerusalem where Jews, Christians, Muslims, Israelis, and Palestinians walk off kumbaya into the sunset getting along, come on. Bluntly, Palestinians would love to drive us into the sea. We would love to drive them into the Jordanian desert to die. Um, this is going to be the least romantic permanent status. I don't use the word peace agreement in history. The two-state solution is the best way that Palestinians and Israelis will get rid of one another because they can't possibly annihilate one another. Not a terribly romantic image of lions lying down with lambs or something like that. And that means there will be a border. And that border will be an impermeable border. I will need to go to Sheikh Jarrah and to visit my good friends there and present an Israeli passport. It's not pretty, but that's where we're going. My good friend Shlomo Gazit, the former head of Israeli intelligence, once told me, Danny, I never liked the Oslo agreements. I was never sure if it was a marriage or a divorce. We are heading for a divorce, okay? And our security people know how to do that and that the work has been done. For those of you who are concerned that this will be a mortal scar to Jerusalem, your concerns are well taken. Go to a website called SAYA, S-A-Y-A, where very serious work has been done how to create a border in a way that will not mortally scar the city of Jerusalem. It's possible. Final thing. Ezra Weizmann used to say, Let's finish building the state and go home, <laughs> okay? Some people think that an agreement between Israelis and Palestinians is the end of things and everybody will go their separate ways. No. The day the border goes up in Jerusalem is the day the border begins to unravel. Their coexistence in Jerusalem is possible. There are hidden veins and arteries that connect Israelis and Palestinians. When I got hit in the head by, uh, with a rock, I immediately was met by the border patrol. The officers were Druze. I went to the local clinic to get first aid. The physician was a Palestinian who had studied in Cairo. I went to the emergency room and from there to the neurology department, the Hadassah hospital was integrated. It's the, the health system is integrated, that's possible. It's the only place though, that the biblical zoo. The day the border goes up, it will unravel, and 10 years, 15 years afterwards, Jerusalem will not be recognizable. But uh, the, the reconciliation will not begin until the divorce is completed, and the divorce is end of occupation, and the occupation ends in one way and one way only, it ends in a border. There is an argument. That's all right, you can clap for him, it's nice. It's I, I would, don't recommend it. We so rarely hear voices of optimism, that's what's so amazing. Um, there is an argument to be made that is heard frequently that we're past that point, that the settlement building under these last governments has been so vigorous that it is now impossible to create a contiguous Palestinian state. And even, if, even in Jerusalem, that the settlement of Jewish settlers, especially very religious ones in East Jerusalem, is going to make this kind of division impossible. Okay. You obviously disagree, so tell us why. Uh, well, before I, I agree or disagree, I'm glad you asked the question because it's a minority of us at this point who think that the question's relevant. We're outflanked by postmodernists of two kinds. There are those who say two-state solution is dead as a doornail. Settlements don't matter, it's dead. It's not gonna be. And there are three categories of people who say that. There are the 
Palestinian left, they never accepted the legitimacy of Israel. The Israeli settler right say it's dead because they never accepted the legitimate claims of Palestinians for a state of their own. And then you get people in a foul mood who get up in the morning and there's no two-state solution and then they have two stiff drinks and it comes back, okay? The other category of people are people like Dennis Ross and Aaron Miller, and Aaron's a very dear friend of mine, who say not only is the two-state solution not dead, the two-state solution is immortal. It doesn't matter, you put up settlements, you can take them down. No problem. Well, I think it matters. By the way, they share something, these postmodernists. They both say what happens on the ground doesn't matter. For me, it matters. And I'll explain why. Seven years ago, seven o'clock in the morning, I stood on the mount of Mount, on top of Mount Scopus with six guys. Five of them were in $3,000 suits, Seville Row suits, British guys, and there was a kid in jeans. I started talking to the suits. It turns out I should have been talking to the kid in jeans. The kid in jeans was a guy by the name of David Cameron, who was then the head of the opposition. And I, you know, what did I know? I mean, just you know, I'm an Israeli lawyer. What? Um, and then David, and I explained to him the settlements around Jerusalem. And then David Cameron came back in March of this year as prime minister. He asked to see me. And his first question to me was, in the seven years since I've been here, what's changed? And my answer was, we know more or less, fairly good degree of certainty, where the possible border goes between Israel and Palestine. Everybody who's negotiated in good faith arrives at more or less the same border. In 2007, that would have required the relocation of 100,000 Israeli settlers. Otherwise, there's not going to be a border. And, and don't underestimate how difficult that's going to be. Today, the number is 150,000. And that number, 150,000, is growing by 10,000 people a year. And the number 10,000 is growing exponentially. At some point, it will no longer be possible. We are hanging on by our fingernails to the two-state solution. It is possible to destroy the two-state solution. We are close to the tipping point. I don't believe they're there, but I might be wrong. Another four years of settlement activity, the likes of which we have seen in the past four years, there is no two-state solution and there is no greater threat to the exist to the viability of Israel than the loss of the two-state solution. Because destroying the two-state solution does not create an alternative. It condemns Israel to being a perpetually occupying power. Is it your opinion that, Pres that Prime Minister Netanyahu is pushing Israel in that direction? Yes. What is his vision of the end game? I will, I will try and be fair, something that lawyers are not usually allowed to do, uh, and to try and describe to my understanding how Netanyahu sees this future when he, ta when he addresses himself, okay? Uh, I never met Netanyahu, I studied history with his father at Cornell, and I think I can understand a lot of stuff as a result of that. Uh, but I've been playing chess with Netanyahu for the last 20 years. You know, he moves, I move, so I think I have an idea. And standing on that spot where I was with Cameron, overlooking the Judean desert, Maaleh, Dumim, and Harei Gilad, I think Netanyahu would begin the way he, be, he, he addressed his father in, in the eulogy for his father. His father passed away about a year and a half ago, at the age of 101. And he said, um, Dad, I'm eternally grateful for you for having taught me one of the most important lessons of my life, that a people can't survive without a, a keen ability to identify danger, and the Jewish people lost the ability in diaspora to identify danger. It's kind of a spooky way of looking at things. Um, the world is a dangerous place for everybody. It is doubly dangerous for Jews and Israelis. And I, as Prime Minister, am responsible for the survival of a people who have lost the genetic co uh, composition to preserve themselves. I look out here, looking out at the Judean desert, 
and I say, this land is mine. It's not Woody Guthrie, this land is my land, this is land is your land, this land is our land. There is one entitled and empowered people to the west of the Jordan River, and that is the Jewish people. The land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. Jerusalem belongs to the Jewish people. But I am not a primitive ideologue. I know that if I am to navigate these dangerous waters of the Middle East and the international with all of these goyim and anti-Semitim, I have to look reality straight in the face. And when I look reality straight in the face, I see there are six, seven million Palestinians living in the land of Israel. They are not entitled as the Jewish people are. They are not empowered as the Jewish people are empowered, and they have to stay that way, but they are facts, and I have to accommodate these facts. And if I will try and maintain control over all of them, Israel will be accused of being an apartheid state, an occupying power, not good for the Jews. I will cede the minimum ground territory possible, the built-up Palestinian areas. They will be cantons. They will be enclaves. They will be islands. And they will not be contiguous. They will be connected by roads and tunnels. And that is what I will call a state. Will that be acceptable? No. But I don't believe that the Jews can arrive at an agreement with the, anybody in the Arab world that will guarantee our survival. We will do this unilaterally because the Jewish people is going to survive based on its power and not by the power of an agreement. And therefore, it is useful for me to say, I support the two-state solution. I'm not going to put a map on the table because that will make things difficult because the rest of the world won't see what I'm presenting as a state. Um, but that's my vision of the future, and we will be living by the sword. Now, during the negotiations that Kerry conducted, there were more tenders, settlement construction, than there were in the previous four years put together, and it wasn't random. They were, these settlements were building the border unilaterally. At the same time, Zippy Livni, our negotiator, who is serious about the two-state solution, was not allowed to talk borders. She was not allowed to talk Jerusalem. She was not allowed to put a map on the table. Why did the talks collapse? Because the border between Israel and Palestine and the status of Jerusalem were not being negotiated inside the negotiating room. They were being created by earth-moving equipment and settlement construction outside of the negotiating room. But that's Netanyahu. So tell, tell us about Jewish settlement in East Jerusalem. Yeah, when I'm done. You're right, when I'm done, okay? And, okay. and I have only a few more, and then we'll have a chance to have the audience ask questions, okay? Okay, the, it depends on what you mean by settlements. There are two major categories of settlements in East Jerusalem, and most of these are not considered by many Israelis as settlements at all. There are 200,000 Israelis living beyond the 1967 boundary in East Jerusalem. 197,000 of them live in large settlement neighborhoods, Gilo, East Talpiot, Ramot. Now, these are lands that we took from the Palestinians. Since 1967, Israel expropriated 35% of the privately owned land of Jerusalem, and we built homes for Israelis, 53,000 homes. We built less than 600 for Palestinians. The last of those was 1978. The goal, to make Jerusalem have a robust Israeli majority and indivisible. The second category is much smaller, and those are the settlement enclaves within existing Palestinian neighborhoods that get into the Kishkes. 
It's Silwan, the city of David, Ras al Amud, where in areas that do resonate with Jewish history, settlers who are motivated by a national religious ideology, sometimes messianic, have created enclaves in these neighborhoods and often with using very, very problematic means. There are about 2,600 of those settlers. It is widely recognized, including by the Palestinians, that the 197,000 Israelis who live in the large settlement neighborhoods will be incorporated into Israel without moving. Their neighborhoods will no longer be settlements. They will be part of sovereign Israel. That is called the land swap. We ripped off the Palestinians. And for every inch of territory, we're going to pay them back. But the, we won't pay them back by dismantling these neighborhoods. We will pay them back by giving them equal quality land elsewhere, and we've done the calculus, okay? That's the deal. So for most Israelis, overwhelmingly, in a politically divided Jerusalem, the folks in Talpiot, Mizrach, or Ramot are not only not relocated, they don't change the way they go to work. I very much doubt that that will be the case with the 2,600 settlers in the existing Palestinian neighborhoods not entirely clear. I think it will be likely that they will have to be relocated, namely extracted, if there's going to be an agreement. But those are the two categories of the settlement areas in Jerusalem. I just want to ask, I have one more question, and then we'll ask for questions from the crowd. Um, you mentioned that President Rivlin, Ruven Rivlin, has in him seeds of greatness. He's a bit of a mystery to us because we're used to reading Israeli politics in terms of left and right, and he seems to belie those, those divisions. So tell us who he is and what is that greatness that you see in him? Well, first of all, I, I suggest that we suspend it, but we, we haven't seen a lot of him yet. He's been in public life for many years. Have no illusions. Ruby Rivlin, president, Ruby Rivlin, is the son of the ideological right. He is not a two-stater. He is a one-stater, okay? Uh, he is opposed to a political division of the, or was prior to becoming president, and I don't believe he's changed his mind. He is probably the quintessential representative of the founder of revisionism, Jabotinsky. And others who have become marginal, like Don Mary Dor or Begin. Um, what is unique about him is that he is a genuine humanist and a genuine Democrat. Um, and you know, it's kind of you know, I, I'm going to tread on dangerous ground here. It's like being a Rockefeller Republican. You're on the endangered species list. Uh, no, he's not a, you know, a liberal, but it is genuine. You go to somebody like Ahmed Tibi, who is probably the most emphatic and acerbic state spokesperson in the Knesset, a member of Knesset and Palestinian citizen of Israel, who knows us clinically, by the way, he's a physician, and he says there is no member of Knesset who treats the Arab members of Knesset or the Arab population with greater equality and greater dignity than Reuven Rivlin. Um, and he is expressing that. Um, for a president to say an unpleasant truth that Israel is a sick society that is stricken with clinical racism is something that politicians don't say openly, and he said it, and he means it. That hasn't turned him into a member of Meretz, and it hasn't turned him into a left-winger, and it, he's still where he is. But there is his ideology, which is deeply rooted, is tempered by humanism, a commitment to democratic values and pragmatism. Keep an eye on him. He's going to surprise us. Great. We're going to take a few minutes and ask uh, people for questions. Let me explain to you. We're delighted you're all here. Uh, some of you are guests, so haven't done this before. We have a custom here at Valley Beshalom about how you ask a question. First of all, you raise your hand politely, and this is Louise, and she will bring you the microphone. 
Only the person holding the microphone asks the question. A question at Valley Beth Shalom is a one-sentence interrogatory that begins with the word what, where, why, when, and how, which is intended to elicit an answer from Mr. Seidman. If you would like to give a speech about your expertise on Middle East politics, we're delighted to hear it. You come to Stephen S. Wise Temple this Shabbos morning, <laughs> you tell any one of the rabbis that you're, you've come to deliver that speech. But if your talk begins with the words, do you think that, or don't you know, or in my opinion, I'm going to cut you off. Because I, am, um, I have only a few more minutes with this wonderful guest, and I want to hear his opinion. So, what, where, why, when, and how, one line, one sentence, it ends with a question mark. Doug Workman, you're the first one. Why is it that the polling data for the upcoming election seems to indicate that all the problems that you're indicating, uh, that the Israelis are going to move to the right? You know what? Number one, I don't deny the polling data, but I highly recommend not to rely on polling. There are just so many moving parts at the moment that I think it would be folly to, okay, to, to hazard a guess. Um, these are already being perceived as pivotal elections in Israel. I would suggest suspending judgment. Having said that, it is clear that there has been a rightward shift in Israeli public opinion. The simplistic explanations are, and even somebody as smart as President Clinton said, ah, it's because there were a million Russians who came. Very simplistic. I would tend to put it this way. The first intifada discredited, irrevocably discredited, the greater Israel movement. Most Israelis knew the dream of controlling all of biblical is Israel is over. The second intifada, which came on the heels of a failed political process, discredited political processes. And Israelis believe that the only way out of this is a two-state solution, but it's not accessible. Add to that the horrible wave of terror that we Israelis experienced. I brought, the first time my kids got on a bus was when they came to the United States because they grew up in those years. And both Israelis and Palestinians are deeply scarred people and our fears are not all legitimate, all, all illegitimate. Um, Palestinians haven't the vaguest idea of what our fears are, and we have no idea how humiliated and subjugated they are. So we're damaged goods, but who isn't? Um, uh, and I believe that, I believe in the decency of the Israeli public. I think that in these elections, we will be confronting the genuine existential dilemmas of the Jewish people in this time. I'm not pessimistic. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. When, where, why, how, and how many Jews will be living in a Palestinian state, and where will they vote? Um, they will not be living in a Palestinian state. Um, and I'll explain why I'm not pleased with that, but that's the deal. Um, and let me explain why. There's a small area just to the east of the Green Line, an area that was Jordanian. It's called Kever Shimon HaTzadik. It's the tomb of Simon the Righteous. It's a genuine, bona fide Jewish holy site. I'm secular. What do I mean by that? It's been a site of pilgrimage for a thousand years. And Jews bought the land there in the 1870s and have gone back to settle. And they're saying, no, not the original families, ideological settlers. And there are seven or eight families there. And they are saying, this land belonged to Jews. We've recovered it. Israeli law allows for Jews to recover properties lost in the war in 1948. And there's no doubt it belonged to the Jews. And we're going home. Now, 
I have three daughters at home and they all have driver's licenses, which means I never see a car. So I always go to Sheikh Jarrah by cab and 50-60% of the cabbies in Jerusalem are Palestinian. And every time they take me to Sheikh Jarrah, I get the same response. Look, you're going home, we're going home. Let us take you to our family home in Bakka, in the German colony. You want to implement a right of return of Jews to biblical Palestine? Great. There was one war, one city, you lost property and are getting it back. We're losing property and, getting, or, and going to get it back. The price of insisting that Israelis be able to invoke a right of return to live in Palestine will kick the hornet's nest of the right of return and we will pay for it dearly. We are heading for radical surgery. Do I like it? No. But we should face this with no illusions. Is the growing Orthodox Jewish community in the rabbinate that's fairly right-wing in Israel going to undermine your optimism? You know, in, in the 1930s, a Bundist, a Yiddishist, anti-Zionist socialist, went to Menachem Yusishkin and told him with scorn, you're not going to build a Jewish state with these people. And Yusishkin responded, what do you want? They're the only Jewish people I have. <laughs> we are a complicated society. Um, we're made up of tribes. We're held together very delicate seams. That's what we have. There is also wisdom among the ultra-Orthodox. There are also going to have to be changes, but that's the deck that we have. Traditionally, the ultra-Orthodox have been political doves internationally, or they have been uh, available for the highest bidder. They have some of the best rabbis that money can buy. Um, how this will work out, I don't know. That's what we have to deal with. No easy answer. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. The, there, the percentage of Israelis who are ultra-Orthodox in his... Please, the mic I want to ask a follow-up question. The percentage of Jewish Israelis in Jerusalem who are ultra-Orthodox is large and growing. And if I'm not mistaken, I may be mistaken, but you probably know the statistic, the number of children under the age of 12 in Jerusalem who are ultra-Orthodox is something like 80%, 70 or 80%, an enormous number. So you live there, and you're not ultra-Orthodox. Does it become uncomfortable at any point? Does the Seidman family at some point say, we can no longer live as the non-religious Jews in this city, we're going to have to move out? Does Jerusalem become totally orthodox at one point? It's a great question. Um, the one way that I ruined, or my wife and I ruined our three children, is we've turned them into local patriots. Unlike their friends, they're remaining in the city, but they say we're going to be the last secularists in the city and we'll, be the, we'll shut out the light on the way out cynically. Um, but let's take a hard look at the city. I'm, I'm a Zionist. I celebrate Independence Day in a way that every civilized individual in every civilized country celebrates Independence Day. You have a barbecue. Why that's a universal, I don't know, but it's the same in Israel, the United States, South Africa, everywhere. I am a small minority in Jerusalem of those who celebrate Israel's Independence Day, 37%, 38% of the population are Palestinian. And without an ounce of malice, my independence is their Nakba. They're not celebrating. And Epis, you have heard that the ultra-Orthodox have certain outstanding issues with the Zionist enterprise. They're 24% of the population. Uh, we're talking about less than 40% of the residents of Jerusalem who 
are really Israeli, and I'm not here to diss the uh, ultra-Orthodox as not being Israeli, but they don't buy into the core values of Israeli society. Um, I believe that Israeli rule over East Jerusalem is not only making life difficult and dysfunctional in East Jerusalem, it's making life difficult and impossible in Israeli Jerusalem. And Israeli Jerusalem will begin to heal on the day that occupation ends, and then we will deal with these issues. And the issues are not um, uh, trying to keep up with the fertility rate of the ultra-Orthodox, but it is engaging an ultra-Orthodox population that is living in poverty and is dying to get into the workforce and is willing to get into the workforce, but the conditions haven't been created. But we have the, 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 every all of the energies of Jerusalem have been channeled into winning the war of the womb with the Palestinians, and we've lost. Once we will no longer have to artificially maintain this demographic balance, Jerusalem will begin to heal. So yes, Jerusalem has its problems, and it's not a productive city. It's an impoverished city, and it's very, it's, it's an uneducated city. The worst schools in the country are in Jerusalem. And what, what, what's happened to us? But we can deal with that when we take the energies that we're using to sustain something that's not achievable, a myth of United Jerusalem, and to devote it to what's really dear to us, a Jewish society and a Jewish capital in its values and not in the size of the territory. Uh, what, what, excuse me. what would be wrong with assimilating the Arabs of East Jerusalem into the Jewish state? Nothing wrong with it at all, except for two things. They don't want to, and we don't want them. Aside from that, it would work perfectly. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that simple. Uh, it, it, they really don't want to be Israeli, and we don't want them. So you know, people will, will say, Israel offered the Palestinians citizenship. No, we never offered them citizenship. We said, you can apply, and we can say no. But that, is that cruel? No, they didn't want it. It was an unholy alliance. We didn't offer them a citizenship they didn't want. It's based on a fiction. In order to achieve your goals, it means we're going to have to have give and take on both sides. In relation to the Temple Mount, can you, is it too, expecting too much to ask that at least Jews and Arabs Share the week, share the days, share the months of praying at the Temple Mount. Why do you have to ask such a difficult question? I mean, I was doing really well until now. You know, it's the chutzpah of asking such a good question. Okay, I will do my best. Um, there's the whole question of the status quo on the Temple Mount. We have each of the attachments, and so do the Muslims, and neither of us are going away. And that has been fueling the conflict, and what we're witnessing today is the morphing of a political conflict. Oh, me? We're witnessing a political conflict that is morphing into a religious conflict. A political conflict can be solved, a religious conflict cannot be solved. Okay? Now, going to your going question. To I took a hard look at this. You know, the common wisdom is, look, the people who want, the Jews who want to pray on the Temple Mount, they're Rosa Parks. They're moving to the front of the bus. Why shouldn't they be able to pray? This is a First Amendment issue. This is religious freedom. And the people who oppose it, and every prime minister in Israel's history, including Menachem Begin, Sharon, Olmert, and Netanyahu, oppose Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount, say, they may be right, but Arabs are crazy. Well, I took a hard look at this because I had some personal experience. I asked the following question. What was the status quo on the Temple Mount during the British Mandate? And the answer is, there was none. 
Why? Because Jews made no claims to the Temple Mount. There were opportunities to make claims. There were a cust commission that dealt with how to share religious sites. Jews didn't want any practical thing on the Temple Mount. They wanted to pray to it. We had deep attachments. The rabbinic opinion was blanket, esort, total prohibition. Were there contested sites between Jews and Muslims? You're damn right there were. The Kotel, the Western Wall, was. Kever Rachel was. And by the way, we're not the only crazy ones in Jerusalem. You should see what happens at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Church of the Nativity. They're worse than we are. But the Temple Mount was not. Okay, begin with that. Fast forward. I'm in the army in 1980, and I had the opportunity on a number of occasions to take officers under my command to visit the Temple Mount. Now at the time, the Waqf, the Islamic Endowment, earned their keep by charging an entrance fee. And I would go to the Temple Mount with a booklet. It was a voucher booklet, payment vouchers, of the Israeli Ministry of Defense. And I would step aside and I would fill it out and translate Arabic, Hebrew. I would leave one payment voucher with the waqf guard, take two copies, send it off to Tel Aviv. Now they needed me like they needed a case of herpes. But it was dignified, it was respectful, it was cordial, and it worked. Fast forward again. We have a minister of construction by the name of Uri Ariel, who is responsible for the settlements, and he's also a temple mounter. He believes in Jewish prayer, and he believes in the construction of the third temple. Now, he is the member of a cabinet which says no Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount, but that doesn't bother him. He goes and he prays to the Temple Mount, contrary to the instructions of the police, the instructions of the Shin Bet, and the policies of his own government. Now, you can pray quietly and nobody will know, but I'm sure you guys have noticed on international flights that the ultra-Orthodox apparently have a psak halacha. You're not allowed to pray beneath 30,000 feet because it does not sufficiently annoy the other passengers. It's, it's, it's aggra aggravated devotion. Uri Ariel, it's not enough that he pray. He has to make sure that everybody knows he's praying. So he's a Kohen, so he does Birkat Kohanim. And then he goes on camera and says, I would be delighted, as I am ministers, uh, minister of construction, to see the construction of the third temple. That's not policy. That's pyromania. Now, sum this up. There's an institution that we have in Jerusalem, I'm sure you have it here, called Open House, where people's individual homes or workspaces are open to the public because they are architectural gems. Why should only the people who own them see them? So I think that when I went to the Temple Mount in 1980, it was an open house. The owner didn't like it, but it was fine, it was cordial, it was short, and we went inside Al-Aqsa Mosque as Jews, military officers in uniform. Today, the open house is, you walk in and you say in a loud voice, you know, I'm not sure if we're gonna be taking all four rooms and throwing half of the people out or just two of them. We are not clear on that, but this is gonna change and we're gonna make major renovations and then you take out the tape measure and measure the curtains and saying the changes are coming and this is not a kibitzer like me, this is from Israel's Minister of Construction. There are pathological responses to this in Islam. One pathological response is denying our connection to the Temple Mount. The other pathological response is the violence that erupts as a result of this. But the, the Temple Mount for a thousand years was not a contested site since the end of the Crusades. And during the last 10 years, it has become a contested site and the people who are contesting it are dangerous. They have what to fear. As far as I'm concerned, no Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount. Yes, Jewish access, Christian access, Buddhist access, because that's part of the stability of the Mount. But they are not Rosa Parks. I have this last question. Why do you remain the 
kind of person you are in the sense of never losing your elemental optimism. I don't think I'm an optimist. Um, as devoutly secular, I'm carrying out my form of mitzvot, okay? Um, let me tell you a story, okay? The, the real reason I'm in the States is that my father is going to be celebrating his 90th birthday next week. Um, I have seen him, but the granddaughters haven't seen him for a number of years, and all of the family is gathering to celebrate. My grandfather, my father's father, was a soldier in the German army in World War I. My father lived in Nazi Germany, grew up in Nazi Germany until he was 16, um, and fled Nazi Germany via Warsaw, Moscow, um, Peking, Vladivostok, Kobe, Japan, Seattle, Washington, and landed at the end of 1940 in Seattle, Washington. Graduated Garfield High School in 1942, was immediately inducted into the American army, and ended up in Germany in the American occupying army in 1944, where, by the way, he met my mother, Zichruna um, Levracha. Two weeks ago, um, I had the privilege of accompanying um, Foreign Minister Steinmeier, the German foreign minister uh, in Jerusalem, um, and the question was, what should Germany be doing to help the Jewish people? And let there be no doubt, there is no world leader who is more committed to the well-being of Israel than Angela Merkel. She is deeply aware of the burdens of German Jewish history. And I sat there and had goosebumps. But I said, Chancellor Merkel shouldn't say what I believe. She should say what she believes. And by saying what she believes will be the greatest service that she could do the Jewish people. And she, what does she believe? My support of Israel is axiomatic. I have your back. I support your security. But I will be powerless to prevent you from sliding into abject isolation if you continue and pursue policies that I, as your friend, can't accept. I went to Israel because I believe that in this dangerous world, Jews need power. But power is not Ruth's strength. Power is a commitment to security. Power is the Air Force. Power are the 15 years that I, my daughters, and my wife have spent in uniform all together. But power is also knowing to navigate these dangerous waters and the survival of the Jewish people depends on our ability to live in a dangerous world. Um, so I get up in the morning and look at the dangers and see what can be done about it. Am I optimistic about the outcome of the elections? No. Am I pessimistic? No. I know we have to do everything in our power to put Israel back on course. If we don't succeed now, we'll try again. What else are you going to do? Before we conclude, a word of thanks to the leaders of Americans for Peace Now, to Steve and to uh, David, wherever you are. Thank you for organizing this evening and for sharing this evening with us. A very special, um, a very special hug and kiss to our, 
our dear friend, our teacher, Professor Jerry and Ruby Bubis. Thank you for sharing yourselves with us so generously. Um, a commercial before I say thank you to Mr. Seidman. Here's a commercial. This is the most interesting moment in Jewish history that you could have chosen to be born. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Because this is a conversation that our ancestors only dreamed about having. To be able to balance Jewish morals and Jewish power and to govern the city of Jerusalem and to figure out how to do it with conscience but with safety is a remarkable Jewish decision to get to have to make. Mm -hmm. And it's been almost 2,000 years since we've had to make, had to have these conversations. It's been a privilege to have them with you tonight. Um, if you'd like to come and see them on the ground, here's my commercial. In February, Valley Beth Shalom is taking a trip. I'm taking a trip. It's a one-week trip to Israel, direct flights from here to, to Tel Aviv and back, and seven days on the ground. It's a study trip. We spend all day, each day, studying the important issues that shape the state of Israel. We listen to people from the left. We listen to people from the right. We get a little dizzy doing that. And in the evening, we sit in beautiful restaurants, eat wonderful food, drink copious amounts of wine, and in the morning, we do it all over again. Seven days of learning about Israel. You're all welcome. There's a brochure on the table. Please come with us. It would be a joy. Tonight, it has been a joy spending the evening with, I think, one of the very few people who really exudes a sense of hope and a sense of faith in the people of Israel, in the city of Yerushalayim, and in the possibilities for peace. Let's thank Danny Seidman.